Good morning. I am um, very pleased to be here with you. It seems that the world is standing up and taking notice of much of what is happening in the Middle East. And there are more and more opportunities for us to speak and speak loudly and speak in a way that is now being understood. There is no doubt that there is a huge role for journalists and for media. There is no doubt that this role will continue to grow. But there is also a need for an understanding of what is achieved through reporting facts. It is without a doubt that the vast majority of the people of the world will experience the vast majority of the world's occurrences through the eyes and interpretation and explanation of a very small minority of those who report these events to those people. And that is why it is important to have that perspective. An American writer by the name of Leslie Cockburn said, journalism for me has always been a calling. There are things that must be exposed to the light, truths that must be uncovered, stories worth risking your life for. It's very easy to be condemning and to be critical. But as someone who sees a lot of positive things in life and looks for the positive, I also understand that the drive of most, if not all, of people who go into journalism is a drive that is honorable, to bring things to the front and to report things in a way that they see is important. The reach of media now is changing. The dynamics are changing. The emergence of social media has meant that conventional media is in a very different place. It is more wide reaching so that we have the conventional doing what it has done for decades. But now, for all intents and purposes, every person is a journalist. Everyone with a phone, a Twitter account, a Facebook profile, or who can just pick up a Skype line and speak to a reporter anywhere in the world is a reporter. And what that has done is it has pushed conventional media and conventional reporting to try to catch up and to keep up. There is no doubt that media, journalism, reporting will impact and direct public opinion. And it will generate a response. And that is both positive and negative. That will work both for and against people on every side of the argument. But what we must realize is media coverage goes deeper than what happens on your monitor. Media coverage impacts lives. We are now in such a, a state in the world that, that sometimes concerns me. Everyone wants to watch some kind of Big Brother program or watching some celebrity digging his way out of some jungle somewhere in the world. We want to watch what's happening in kitchens when people are brought together to cook or when families, some prominent families in this country, decide to get up to their shenanigans. The idea is we've become voyeuristic. We want to watch people's lives rather than live our own. And the media we have helps us towards that. 
And the media we have encourages us to focus on the lives of others rather than on we, what we can do. There has been a greater focus and interest now, alarmingly, on how things are reported rather than what is reported. So speed is essential. Immediately, immediacy is essential. How you can get your news on your phone, through what app? Which Twitter accounts you follow? How quickly this news updates? How often the website refreshes? And of course, this puts an immense amount of pressure on journalists and those who provide media. It is no longer about looking at the details of the story, verifying, making sure that what is said is actually what has happened, representing an opinion in the right way, rather than how someone has perceived it or reported it. I try not to, but I found that I myself have fallen foul once that I remember of tweeting something too quickly and then actually going back and deleting it because I just realized, well, I didn't verify that fact and so I can't actually tweet it out from my account because someone will look at that, say the bishop has said and therefore it must be credible, or at least I'd like to think they would, and so therefore it must be true and so therefore I will tweet it as well and I will circulate it as well. Because of a lack of resource, because of tightening budgets, because of changing structures, because of flattening management models, there is much more pressure on media networks. And so you have people sent to different parts of the world or used from different parts of the world to become your source of news. That unfortunately does not always come with a wealth of experience or local knowledge or local understanding. It becomes an obstacle to accurate reporting because it becomes your truth. If your person on the ground has reported this to you, then it becomes your truth. And your truth becomes the truth of others as well. When they read this, when they <coughs> internalize it, when they believe it, when they use it, when they propagate it. But that could all stem from something that is less than detailed and less than accurate. The thing about sensational recording is, or reporting, is that it gets a reaction, and we want a reaction. That's why when I was discussing with those preparing today, the two words that came to my mind were, were sensitivity and sensationalism because they cannot go into the same approach for reporting. The dangers of sensationalist reporting are that they aim for a reaction, and if they don't get it, then they will change the story. And that creates distrust. And it creates a sense of isolation. If a community on the ground feels that it has been misrepresented, misreported, then it feels that it can no longer not only respect or trust this source, but all Western media becomes bad. All Western reporters become dishonest. All Western media sources become self-interested and must have a hidden agenda. And of course, anyone who has dealt with the Middle East will know that Conspiracy is quite often what drives theory. People then feel marginalized, feel rep misrepresented. And that stems from a lack of knowledge of the Middle East dynamic. 
There is no one size fits all for Middle East Christians or Middle East minorities or the Middle East. The situation of Christians in Egypt and Lebanon is very different to those of Christians in Libya, Syria, and Iraq. <clears throat> the attitude of Christians there, their feeling that they can continue, they want to continue, is different. And so to present one picture of what's happening to Christians in the Yazidis and Shabaks and every other minority in the Middle East, just to make it easier for press, just to make it easier for publication, just to make it easier for those who digest the news, doesn't always give the greatest indication of, of the news or the facts. Two negative scenarios quickly. In 2011, <clears throat> a group of peaceful demonstrators went on the streets of Egypt to demonstrate against the attack on burning the church. And going past the government news building in an area called Maspiro, <coughs> were attacked. They were mowed down by armored personnel carriers. They were run over. They were killed. And yet, the Egyptian media at the time, Egyptian state media, had reporters going on air saying, go protect your army because the Christians are attacking your army. Now, since then, we've known the relationship between the Egyptian people and their army. So when you're there and you're telling people that Christians are attacking their army to go and protect them, that incites. Likewise, when they had the attacks on the churches in August 2000, 2013, unprecedented, 50 churches, 50 places of Christian ministry attacked within a very small space of 48 hours. Again, it took the world two weeks to report on that. After that, it was more legitimate, but two weeks for the world to wake up to the fact that if these had been a hundred other places of worship of any religious group in any part of the world under any conditions, would we have kept silent? The positive case study, however, is that of Libya. Recently, 21 Christians who had gone to Libya to support their families, as you all know, were captured and beheaded brutally. This was a turning point for the news. This was a turning point for the world. This showed that even evil had a red line that people didn't want it to cross. And then there was a reaction. These 21 unknown men from a small village had suddenly impacted tens of millions of people around the world because of the way they lost their lives and the witness they had presented. Because of the clarity of this reporting, the sincerity of it, the credibility of it, the Coptic community felt empowered. It felt that it was supported. Media, however, can positively impact but it must work towards reporting facts and not generating a narrative. It must work towards reporting facts on the ground rather than guiding and directing public sentiment and public opinion. A dear friend of mine, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, said that good journalism is one of the models of good conversation, communication in the wider social context. And that's what it should be, a good model of good communication, of good conversation, with an attempt to understand what's happening on the ground, with a requirement that the culture is understood, that there is an integrity in reporting, an understanding of the religious framework in which the region, the region lives and exists. It will then create a system of trust of people. When it listens to what people are saying, rather than just how they're saying it. Again, listening to the Middle East, you see people who become angry, who say things 
because of a difference of language, a difference of expression, a difference of culture, it's very easy to pick up on that. Much more difficult, yet much more fair, to actually dig into it and see what is meant by what was said, rather than just what was said. And that comes from experience and comes from knowledge. It comes from an integrity and a desire to present a proper picture. It means that the outpouring of emotion doesn't generate the headlines and become inflammatory and becomes misrepresenting of those who may just be grieving. The media must always reflect humanity in the situation in which it finds itself. It must remember that human beings are not just numbers and statistics, and unfortunately we've all been numbed. We turn on our televisions when we hear that only 10 people died today in Iraq, that must have been a good day. And it's tragic, and it's horrible. But each one of those 10 lives is a life that has touched 10 families, and communities, and countries. We need to steer away from labeling communities and groups, generalizing. We must report atrocities as atrocities and not be selective because of who they may fall upon or which interests they may serve. We must not merely seek the lowest common denominator or the simplest model to present because sometimes Often, what happens is far from simple, and it needs a more critical and informed eye. We must work to ethically and genuinely report news, not create scenarios that we want to propagate. And above all, journalism must focus on truth, verification, the public good, rather than speed, productivity, and mere output. Thank you. <laughs>